Scenes from an uprising, images of a people fighting for freedom. For months, an undercover Al Jazeera journalist traveled through Syria, a witness to its hope and its sorrow. Filmed secretly on street corners, through car windows and behind closed doors, this is his remarkable account of a country in revolution. I can't tell you my name. I've spent many months secretly in Syria for Al Jazeera. I cannot show my face and my voice is disguised to conceal my identity because I don't want to endanger my contacts in Syria. Because carrying a camera would be risky, I took my cell phone with me as I moved around the country and captured images from the uprising that have so far remained unseen. The footage, some of which you'll see in this film, tells a story of ordinary Syrians showing extraordinary courage. I followed them on protests, I saw them demonstrate and fight and die, and I even heard their songs of freedom. This is their story. What am I looking at? You're looking at sound bombs, which can't hurt anyone, really. They're things that kids use. So what's the point? First to send a message to the security. If you're able to take us down, then we can take you down, because we're your neighbors everywhere. The second point is for people that hasn't entered the revolution yet, to see how the sounds of bullet and explosions in other areas like in Homs and Idlib. And you're able to detonate them remotely as well? Yes. And you've used these against security forces to see their reaction? Yes. How have they reacted? Uh, badly. They panic. They start shooting. In some areas, they actually started shooting everywhere. If you're going out every day expecting to die, it helps to believe in martyrdom. It helps to have this religious element motivating you, giving you courage because every single demonstration you go to, you're aware of the possibility that you might be shot. I took mini bus full of uh, students returning home for the weekend from Damascus to San Amin, which is the second largest city in uh, Dara province. Totally surrounded by security forces, there uh, actually has a residence for military officers as well and a variety of security bases. We were stopped at several checkpoints, but I was sitting in the back with my head down and the guys I was with distracted the attention of the security officers. So I was able to enter unchecked. Electricity was shut off when we arrived. It was about 5 p.m. when we got there. Already dark because it's winter. Complete blackness. It's very eerie here in this urban environment. And you can't see anything except the occasional light from a cell phone, uh, a cigarette. People use cell phones for lights because cell phones were also down. They block communications, especially on Thursday nights, Friday mornings. People get ready for the big demonstration on Friday. And they put me in a safe neighborhood on one of the areas which wasn't known for its demonstrations. Uh, within that town in order to uh, avoid random searches by the security forces. San Amin is one of the sites of an early massacre committed by uh, Syrian military security who just opened fire directly into a crowd of demonstrators. There's constant raids at night searching houses looking for people. It's, you very much feel like you're in an occupied country. The next day, Friday, when prayers end, people start shouting, Takabir, Allahu Akbar. They just started to demonstrate, singing the usual anti-regime songs, including one calling for the arming of the revolution. At the first sound of that takbir, or the call for saying God is great, the shooting started. And there are snipers posted on all the high buildings in the area. feeling of uh, sort of medieval occupation where there's this outside force 
just coming in to punish you randomly, angrily, with great deal of cruelty. I travel to much of the country on public buses though. The private vehicles are just more suspect. Or if you travel with a woman, you're also less suspect. There's all kinds of tricks. So I spent much of my time in Damascus and what's called Rif Dimashk, the suburbs of Damascus. Damascus itself is perceived to still be quiet and quiescent, and, uh, but it's not, that's not completely true. So in, in Damascus, they've de developed various guerrilla tactics. One of them is the flying demonstration. A bunch of friends, and a network of uh, so trusted people will each tell their friends, at 5.30 or 7.30, we're going to gather on this corner. Someone's going to shout takbir, we're going to shout Allahu Akbar. The demonstration will begin, we're going to march around. And what they're hoping to do is, is to provoke people in that area to come out as well to support them, and just to make a stand and show that even in Damascus we have demonstrations. And so they'll often film it as well. In fact, part of the value is just so they can film it, put it on YouTube or send it to Jazeera and say even this area had a demonstration. In Damascus is a key area called Midan. It's an old uh, commercial neighborhood with many mosques. Uh, many, many demonstrations came out of these mosques and some of the clerics were actually pro-revolution. People were sort of pushed into mosques. They at first tried to take over public squares, which is neutral territory. But all public squares were taken over by the regime or, or demonstrators were prevented from going there with the use of live fire and massive arrests and beatings. As a result, the mosque became the only gathering place left for people. And the only time that you could coordinate something, you'd know that the evening prayer, the noon prayer, begins at this time, ends at that time. So we're gonna meet at this mosque and it's hard to stop people from going to the mosque. So Islam definitely gives a color to the revolution, to some of the slogans. It's also made people who were previously secular more devout. But you also see Christians and other non-Muslims waiting outside the mosques, or sometimes even going inside the mosque, to be there for the demonstration. As a secular person, I was always you know, trembling, um, because I have been in demonstrations where people are shot and I've heard bullets fly over my head. Um, so yeah, I, that faith really does make a difference, I think. أنا أبو إبراهيم من سوريا من حرستا من مدينة حرستا أنا طلعت بالثورة السورية من أول ما بلشنا فيها بهتف بالثورة السورية سكابايا جروح الزين سكابا هذا الشهداء السورية يشهد هذا السكابا Music is important to the revolution Often people have taken old Syrian and nationalist songs and remade them into their own revolution songs. Or there are new ones that have been written by revolutionaries throughout the country, and people take them and modify them. I saw people smiling and happy, as though for the first time they discovered their dignity. على اليوتيوب وعلى الفيسبوك انا باخذ من غير بلد وغير بلد بتاخذ مني يا حافظ يلعن روحك يا حافظ يا حافظ يا حافظ يلعن you hear a core of the same songs all over the country no matter where you go this is a culture which has a great deal of appreciation for poetry and for live sort of spoken poetry going back to pre-islamic days even. so this very much informs the demonstrations as well It's created this unique subculture where every night you go out and sing the same songs. They're in your head all the time now, all day long. Uh, your little kids know them as well, which is a problem for parents sending their kids to school now.
Birzi is a neighborhood in Damascus, where, which has been the scene of the most revolutionary, sort of on fire area of Damascus. And one of the first places where people actually took up arms inside Damascus against the regime. In Birzi, there's a couple of hundred armed guys. An AK 47 can now cost you $2,000. An AK 47 in Iraq costs $300. There's a huge markup. A bullet for an AK 47 can cost you $2. So in Berzi, we met uh, Fahad, one of these local street toughs who discovered religion once the revolution started. And now basically the people joke that all he does is pray demonstrate and shoot at security forces. Fahad's in his 20s and he also plays a role leading demonstrations. It's called a Hatif, leading them in Hutafat, which are the slogans that they sing. And these guys are very influential in the revolution. They lead the crowd, they're very charismatic. They will often give speeches, they help organize the demonstrations. Fahad, whenever he goes around, has a pocket full of bullets, he has a small pistol in his pocket, and he has a grenade in the other pocket. And many of his friends are similarly armed. The phenomenon is armed locals resisting the regime. Nobody commands it countrywide. There are local commanders everywhere. Some are ex-military, some are not. You now have an indigenous uprising based on local grievances, organized by local leaders, with very little outside support confronting the regime for the first time. There's a foreign element to this, and it's the presence of satellite media who help unite different elements of the country. In Birzi, as in other neighborhoods, they also will often hang up a large screen in order to broadcast the live Al Jazeera broadcasting of their own demonstration. This is a big deal for demonstrators throughout the country. They want to know that they're being seen all over the place. So every night after demonstration, people will go home and turn on Al Jazeera and see who came out tonight and who was shot tonight. As the youth get frustrated with the older people calling for patience and uh, for peaceful demonstrations, there is a demand for arming the revolution and even for a declaration of jihad. <laughs> رقم العسكري 3720 شقيت على الجيش العربي السوري القاتل المجرم شقيت انا من حمص من خالديه شقيت اسباب يعني التاليه هي قتل المدنيين قتل الضباط العسكري الله يشرف احمر شقيت في مدينه حمص خلونا نضرب العالم one of the challenges facing the regime is that they can't secure towns or neighborhoods or, or cities using purely the domestic security forces. They have to use the army. Uh, the soldiers are mostly Sunni and they're from all over the country. They're from Dara, they're from Homs, they're from Idlib. It's their cousins and brothers and families who are taking part in the revolution and demonstrations. And these are soldiers who are anyway less likely to want to shoot at demonstrators. So the more you use your soldiers, the more defections you have. I 
رد يفوت رد ضرب 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 هيك على نفس الوتيره للساعه 2 بالليل 3 بالليل المهم الساعة تقريبا 3 بالليل فاتوا لعنا كنا منتيين ما في ما نقدر نقول اه يعني ما بقى شيء فينا نحن العساكر هو العسكري بشكل عام يعني بالجيش مهان يعني ما له ما له هذيك ال... بيعتمدوا عليه بس وقت الحرب او وقت المظاهرات نحن كانوا يعتمدوا علينا يحطونا حاجز آه عساكر نقتحم على المظاهرات ما نخليها هسه المظاهرات الامن ورانا على طول ورانا اللي ما يقوس ما يضرب ياخذوا او يقتلوا شفت؟ ايه شفت ايه شفت شفت يقتلوا فاتوا عنا وفكوا لنا عودينا فكوا لنا اجرينا وشالوا لنا هدول ضلينا نصنع نطلع على بعض كان المنظر مريب الارض كلها دم عند حديقة العلو بالخالدية اوس بمظاهرة سنية اجى من امن المظاهرة واوس بالخالدية فانا اضطريت اجازة مع ثاني فانشقيت انا مستحيل زي الحمص كمان. آه، نحن عم نتعامل مع سلطات امنيه همجيه لا تعرف معنى الانسانيه. يعني تصور انسان استشهد او قتل على ايد قوات الامن لا لا يسلمون جسده لاهله. يعني ماذا يفعلون بالجسد البراد؟ I spent some time in Homs. It's become famous as the capital of the revolution. It's in the most active part of the country and where there's been the most active armed resistance. There's a revolutionary structure here, almost a state within a state. The Homs Revolutionary Council has been feeding 16,000 families a month to families of the dead, of wounded, of prisoners, of staff, of poor people, and they have their own correspondents all over the city who send reports from every area every night. You may have seen some of their pictures on your TV screens, shocking images of the army bombarding the suburbs of Bab Amr and elsewhere. قناصين متواجدين عند هذه الحواجز والدبابات خلف الدبابي موجه للاحياء العلوية وسبطانة الدبابي سبطانة الدبابي موجهة إلى الحي السني. Many parts of the, of the city haven't had electricity for months. It's almost a post-apocalyptic kind of feeling. You're the only guy, you're the only group of people walking through these streets, and you hear the occasional sniper shot, and you have to run across streets because yeah. snipers might see you. It's almost like Sarajevo. You'll find one apartment block after another, just full of bullet holes, full of rounds from heavy machine guns, even tank rounds at this point. <laughs> So families in these front line apartment buildings um, have had to flee either for safety or because their homes have been destroyed. <laughs> Abdul Basit Sarut, who is a former uh, soccer player, now leads demonstrations in homes. <laughs> عم يصير شهداء اكثر العالم عم تكثر العالم عم تزيد روحها عم يزيد تفاؤل بصير زعل زعل مع الشهيد لانه استشهد زعل على ذكريات الشهيد شلون كان ثوره جيعه <تصفيق> very charismatic, and those who engage with the crowd are especially popular, and particularly if they expose their faces, which basically means that they're not afraid of anything anymore, they have nothing to lose. Despite all this violence and attacks, every night there are demonstrations. People come out in defiance. Uh, it's become something that they have to do. Going out every night and singing and defying and insulting the regime and its thugs um, makes them feel like they're human, like they have dignity, like they have freedom for just that moment of time. If they don't go out, they feel depressed.
there's a phenomenon, sometimes at 9 p.m., sometimes at midnight, of women, children, men, standing on their balconies and shouting, Allahu Akbar. Mostly it's become a statement of defiance. We're still here. And then you'll hear the gunfire in response. As if to remind them that we're still here too. Now I was in Jabal Azawiya, some, some mountainous region, where all the villages are basically armed. And it very much resembles a popular armed struggle where the men of the community have taken up arms and they are fed and cared for by the rest of the community. At the time was basically liberated territory. They had taken over the local police station and they wrote in graffiti on it. Many of these armed guys aren't even living in their hometowns. And some of the guys we've seen in the footage haven't been home in eight months. They're just being protected by locals in this village and they're fighting full time. Each guy has a group and he'll, he'll give his group a name the hawks of Syria, or they'll be named after a martyr or something Islamic. And when there's a need, they all work together. But they'll often also feel envy if one group is well armed and has access to resources because they have an outside sponsor. So how come this guy has 10,000 bullets, but my guys only have enough for two magazines each, 60 bullets each? <laughs> Yusuf Al Hassan is a famous uh, cigarette smuggler, one of the biggest in Syria. And thanks to his wealth, he was able to uh, fund a large armed group, and he was one of the first to take up arms against the regime. Min when? Kif la yatu? He had managed to capture about 50 Cornet anti-tank missiles from the regime. Now his men didn't, most of them didn't know how to use these missiles, but they cherished them like they were new toys. In fact, when the army raided, many of the revolutionaries were grumbling, why didn't Yusuf use any of his missiles? The next day, security forces raided some of these towns. Um, but there was no mobile phone, no landline, no way to communicate with each other. So many of the men that I met in the, in the previous days died fighting the security forces. Others fled with me into the mountains. I was walking through Homs and sniper fire started and I was the only one in the crowd that actually flinched. And a father with his kids was standing by a door and they started laughing at me and pointing and they said, why don't you jump on the floor while you're at it? It's amazing how Syrians who never heard gunfire, because they lived in a very peaceful country, have gotten used so quickly to living in a state of war, how to respond to it. They've very quickly become a mobilized revolutionary society, whereas before they had no experience doing this.